Okay, it's great uh, to be here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of the kinds of work that we do and have been doing for the past several decades. I'm from the Indian Institute of Science, from the Center for Ecological Sciences. And I work on animal communication, and I work on acoustic communication, that is using sound to communicate. Um, I'm a biologist, as you would have figured out. I'm not a mathematician or statistician. And I'm also an ecologist. And I'm interested in how animals communicate with each other. And today what I thought I would do is to tell you some of the stories, both scientific ones as well as some fun personal anecdotes, uh, largely building on um, what I work on, which is on many aspects of acoustic communication signals. We are interested in what the signals themselves look like, in how animals perceive them, right? Uh, what do signals mean to animals? What do calls mean to animals? And how do they communicate in the natural environment, in the ecological context in which they are? And how have such things evolved? So we have an interest in all of these aspects of animal communication. And for today's talk, given that this was a women's session, I thought I would focus on the work done by my women students. I've guided several of them over the years. And I want to show you indeed it is true that almost all of the really hard field projects in my lab have been done by women, not by my men students. And so today I would be focusing more on the projects that my women students have done. Okay? And I'll tell you a little bit about some of their stories, what they did, what they achieved, and where they are. I am, as I said, from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And when I joined about 20 years ago, I wanted to start studying acoustic signals. Uh, I had just come back from Germany and I was very new here. And so the first thing I started to do was to just look around my own campus. And the Indian Institute of Science campus, as almost any campus in India, is very, very rich in all kinds of life, insects, birds, right? And I'm especially interested in these little insects called crickets. These are all species of field crickets uh, found on our campus. And there are like 25 species, at least, of them. And all of these crickets, actually, I'm sure all of you would have heard them anywhere you live, almost anywhere in the world. When evening comes, you will hear cricket calls. Okay? It's such a ubiquitous feature of our soundscape, if you like. Um, so let's ask why crickets call. Basically, all this chirping that you hear from crickets are all produced by males. So adult male crickets call or sing to get females. Okay? So typically, they will sit outside their burrow and produce sounds. They produce their sounds by rubbing their wings together. Okay? And females who might be out there somewhere hear them recognize this song, and then home in on the male. And this is a painting done in the 1700s that actually shows you this. Here's a male cricket calling outside his burrow. Here's a female coming towards him. How do we know she's a female? She has this ovipositor to deposit eggs, which males don't have. So that's how you can recognize the female. And very early on, people did experiments where they would make sound recordings, right, on tape recorders, of these calls. And you can then play back these calls from loudspeakers. You can see this was done very, very long ago um, from the size of the loudspeaker. Today, it would be much smaller. You can put out a loudspeaker that plays back the call of a species of cricket out in the field. And you can see you can attract females, OK? So what such an experiment tells you is that the call is really good enough right, to attract the females from far away. So the acoustic signal alone is good enough to attract females. Um, so it's 
species of crickets, there are many, many species of crickets, and many of them often will share the same environment, the same garden, the same, right? But each species has its own song. Okay? So let me now play to you the songs of three species of crickets. And this was work done by my very first student, Natasha Matre, who started out going around the campus recording songs of these crickets out in the field. And I don't know how many of you have visited IISC. How many of you have? Some of you, yeah. So we have a nice quadrangle opposite our main building, which has a lot of vegetation and grass. And these three species of crickets actually share that space. But they sing differently, and I'm going to, hopefully this will work out, I will sing, I will. Get out of this mode. Yeah. So here's the second species. Does it sound different to you? Yeah. And here's the third. So you can tell them apart, right? Hmm? So let's ask why you can tell them apart. So if you make a song recording, you can actually visualize that recording, and that's what I've done here. You can plot it as an oscillogram with time on this axis and the sound amplitude on the y-axis. And you can see that there are these very pulsed signals, right? You could hear these chirps. The prip, 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 prip that you could hear were these chirps, but they're made up of even smaller units um, which your ear doesn't resolve, okay? So you hear it as one chirp. And the reason that these two songs sounded different to you is because of what we call the temporal features, the timing features. So how long these syllables are, how often they're made, how often the chirps are made are all different, how long the chirps are, and that's why you can tell these two apart. But you can also look at the pitch of the song, which is what is the frequency composition. And to look at that, you plot typically what's called a power spectrum. So you've got frequency on this axis and relative amplitude. What such a spectrum tells you is how the total energy of the song is partitioned across the frequency spectrum. And if you look here, you can see this tight peak here at 5 kilohertz, which tells you that most of the energy in the songs of these crickets is in the 5 kilohertz range. Okay? But if you look at this animal, it's at about 7, which is why, I don't know if you if you realized it, the third one sounded quite different in pitch from the other two, okay? So basically, a combination of these temporal features and spectral features gives you uniqueness for every species of cricket. So we can see that when we make a recording, but the question, of course, is um, can the crickets do that too? And to find out what you do, what Natasha did was she recorded the call of one of the species of crickets. She made a little pit in the lawn in which they live and placed a speaker in here which was producing this call. And we release a female of the species about one meter away. And then we watch what she does and we figure out where she goes. So all of these points simply tell you the path that she takes. And you can see that she walks like this, and then she comes to the trap and she'll fall in. She'll, she'll jump in, actually. Okay. Similarly, here's another example. So basically, they can use this call to home in on the uh, male. If you now play this female, the call of another species, the second species that we heard, you can see that she doesn't even go there, although it's the same frequency, she can hear it quite well, but she doesn't go towards it at all. So what such an experiment tells you very clearly is that these animals can clearly distinguish these song patterns. And so if you think of a situation where different species are calling, they can listen in on the songs and go to the right one. So they go to a male of their species, they don't pick somebody else's song and move towards it. Okay? Um, oh, I could use this, right? Yeah. So the problem really is, how 
do you locate one male among many collars? Okay. So if you think of yourself as a little female cricket, one centimeter in size, this is whole huge field. Males can be many meters apart. Okay. And many of them can all be calling at the same time. Some are your own species, some are a different species. So how do you manage to locate one male, one song, when there are so many playing at the same time? This is often referred to as the cocktail party problem, which is you're at a party, everybody's talking very loudly, but you want to home in on that one conversation, right? And you want to home in on that one person, okay? So this is a, it's quite a challenging problem. It's quite a challenging problem even for a human brain. So, well, how do crickets manage? Because they do live in such environments, or do they? So that was our first question. So. Is there a cocktail party out there? Is there an acoustic cocktail party out there? How do you know that? Yeah? So the way that you can try to get around this is to measure a whole pile of stuff. So you need to know a lot of things. So if you want to understand what that acoustic environment looks like, it's produced by the males. So songs are produced by the males. So you have to know where males are with respect to each other, because that's where each of your sound sources is, and whether they move or not. Right? If they're moving, then you've got an even worse problem. It's dynamic. Okay? But luckily for us, within the night, crickets like to sit in one place and call. So at least you have a static chorus. Okay? You have to know how loudly they call. Okay? And you have to know what happens to sound, what happens to the sound as it goes along the ground. So that's what Natasha did. She would go out in the field, she would mark every single male that was calling. For example, these are maps that she's generated. Each of these little things, dots, is one cricket. Okay? So we know where each of them is. We know how loudly they call. And you can measure how that sound attenuates by simply taking a sound level meter, moving away from the source, and doing this one by one for each male. So you can get attenuation profiles like this. And you know then at what point it sort of peters out to below somewhere like 30, 35 decibel, which is typically the hearing sensitivity of these animals, okay? And we know the hearing sensitivity of ours because we measured it and it's around 40, okay? So you can tell how far out the sound will travel on average until it hits 40. And that's what these circles, these are the average uh, distance that the sound will travel out until a female won't be able to hear it. So in other words, this is the broadcast space of each of these males. This is his sphere of influence, if you like, where he will be heard. Any female inside a circle will hear him. Female outside the circle won't hear him. But what's interesting are the intersections, because these are the spots where females will hear multiple males, right? So you do this exercise for many, many choruses, and then you find out on average, are there lots of such spots where females are likely to hear multiple males? And the answer was yes. But the next question is, well, is it a problem, right? So the, the best thing to do is to ask the crickets. And the way that we did this, we're in outdoor experiments, where, as you can see here, there are four speakers. And the cricket is this little blob in the center. And these are done outside. And we play back the song from all four of them simultaneously, okay? So it's quite a hard task for the cricket. And so that's all four of the speakers playing simultaneously. And the question is, will she be able to go to one of them? Here? This video is one where we are lucky and it happens fairly quickly, but sometimes you have to wait a while. And there she goes to the speaker. So although all four of them were playing, and three of them you can see here were played out at the same uh, sound level, she's still able to locate one and home in on it. The next question we can ask, of course, is if you now do this again and again and again and again, each of this is the path of one cricket, okay? So what you can see is that, 
it for two females out of, I think it was, yeah, 40. Every one of them found a speaker, okay? So overwhelmingly, they can't find speakers, but many come here, some end up there, some end up there, some end up there. So our next question was, how do we get a sense for what drives whether they end up here or here or here or here? The idea is it really depends on what you hear at your position. And then you move, right? Once you move, the world changes, right? The acoustic world changes. So what Natasha set herself out to do was to ask if she could, based on our understanding of the biophysics of the ear and a little bit of what we understand about how the nervous system processes sound, can we make a simulation model? Can we make a virtual female cricket? in a virtual acoustic environment, which is very similar to this, and ask, can we get parts like this? And that was what she did next. Um, so basically, we used all of the data that we got, measuring what the acoustic environment was like. And then we used a series of um, uh, what we knew from the literature regarding the physiology. And we used certain rules which told us what a female could hear and what she could not hear when four sound sources impinge on her at the same time. Okay? For lack of time, I'm not going to go into depth in this. But essentially, so these are her experimental data out there. These are her simulation results. You can see they're really, really good in the sense that you, we could predict the probability, that is the number of crickets that might reach this speaker versus this versus this versus this. We cannot predict for you if you give me any one particular cricket where she'll go, but in a population, we can tell you the proportions that will end up. And we did all kinds of, you know, variations on this, you know, change where they are, change their orientation, and so on. And in all of this, we could at population level actually predict, which gives us some kind of confidence that the rules that we're using are possibly to explain what's going on, okay? Um, let me move on. Okay, so let me wind this up and tell you a little bit more about Natasha. Um, so Natasha finished her PhD with me working on sound localization in crickets, and then she got interested in biomechanics. What is biomechanics? The process by which these crickets actually produce sound using their wings and how they end up producing these really nice tonal signals, right, with only one frequency, and how do their ears, these tiny ears, actually hear them. So the ears of crickets are on their legs, okay, on the first pair of legs. So she went on to examine how these crickets, these are tree crickets, actually produce sounds, what determines their frequency, and these crickets are strange because with temperature, their frequency changes. And she worked on find, figuring out how that happened, okay? And while she was in ISC, she was also uh, responsible for starting the snake rescue volunteers. We have a lot of snakes in ISC. And she started this group that used to go out and rescue snakes, okay? And release them back in the wild. She's also an ace photographer. And she produced this fantastic book called Secret Lives. Um, all of these pictures were taken on ISC campus. Okay? Uh, it was on the biodiversity of ISC campus and was released on our centenary. And she's currently a postdoc still at Toronto, um, continuing work in biomechanics. So I'll move to the next part. And Kind of, well, it's, it's a related problem, but on a different scale. So when you think of communication, you have a sender who makes a sound, puts out a signal that goes out through the medium. In this case, it could be air or water. And then there's a receiver. In our case, it's the female of the species. So you want to send a private message in some sense, because you're really the receiver you want to send it to is a female of your species, but you have to put it out into this public medium. In some sense, it's very similar to your cell phone networks. 
because you have a unique sender who wants to send a message to a unique receiver, but you have to put the signal out into this broadcast medium, okay? Um, there are two major problems that they might face to communicate with each other. One is you're not the only one in the world producing sounds, so you've got a lot of other people wanting to send messages at the same time, and everybody's putting out these calls all together so you could get masking interference, right? So I can't hear that one call. Or you could get distortion as a result of trees and rocks and wind, okay, which can distort the structure of your signal. And the question really, and it's been a question for a long time, that when you go into natural environments, you know, we hear this huge cacophony, everybody's like calling. So how are they managing to get the message across? And that's the next question we tried to answer, and we tried to answer this um, just to give you a an idea of what it sounds like. So that's a tropical rainforest at night. Okay. You can hear so many different things calling, so many different insects calling at the same time. How might one deal with this? So the senders of signals might deal with this and have behaviors that allow them to reduce interference with each other. They might reduce interference by, let's say these are the three different species, by partitioning themselves in time. So A calls in a certain time window, B in another, and C in another. So you're not going to overlap. But, it, but that time could be on very different scales. It could be seasonal. So they don't breed at the same time. Or they have the same breeding season. They don't call at the same time of night, right? So if I call from 7 to 8 and you call from 8 to 9, then we're fine. We don't interfere. Or we actually call at the same time of the day, but we might, you know, alternate at very fine temporal scales, right? I call for a minute and then you call for a minute, right? So the question is, are animals actually using any of these strategies in natural environments? You can also use space, right? You can spread yourselves out. The more you spread yourselves out, the less interference there will be, correct? Right? Because sound attenuates with distance. Or you can space yourself out in acoustic space, and this is perhaps the most interesting. So what you're seeing here is a spectrogram, which is a graph of frequency against time, of something like that cacophony that you heard that I measured out there in the forest. So when we heard it, it was just this massive sound. But if you make a spectrogram, you can see that there are indeed some really nice discrete patterns and bands. And each of these is a different species of cricket. Okay, here, here, okay. So it's almost like these radio frequency bands, so they're actually putting out their signals in these very narrow bands. And if their receivers were tuned into these, then they have really nice private communication channels. There are, of course, regions of, spec of the spectrum which are very crowded. Everybody, so many species actually call in this range of four to six kilohertz. So not everybody can or, or uses spectral partitioning. But one imagines then that some of these might use some of the other methods of partitioning. But do they, is the question. And to find that out, um, okay, you have to measure a lot of things, right? So if you want to attack this problem, you have to measure a lot of things. First of all, you have to know who the signalers are. You know, who are all these people, who are all these insects that are calling out there? What do the signals themselves look like, at what point in time is each of these species calling? Where are they calling from? With respect to each other, because you want to know whether they're partitioning themselves out, okay? And also, what does the medium do to these calls? And this is what we thought to find out in a natural community um, in Kudremuk National Park. So Kudremuk National Park, for those of you who are not familiar, is more or less due west of here near Bangalore, now Mangalore. It's in the Western Ghats. And its terrain looks like this, mountainous, forested. And if you want to work on crickets, you have to work at night. And this is what the forest looks like on a moonlit night. And if you're walking there, well, that's what it looks like on a moonless night. You can't see anything, OK? And my students, Swati Devakar, took on the challenge of this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> so she, she took on the challenge of actually trying to answer all of those questions I told you about in the rainforest at night. It had never ever been done before anywhere in the world. People told us we were completely insane. Okay. Uh, we had to deal with a lot, she particularly had to deal with a lot of uh, very difficult issues. In her first field season, she was bitten by a viper and she spent, we spent three very hard days in the ICU, <laughs> okay? Um, she came out of that and I said, well, you know, this is all too dangerous, this is too difficult, change your project. And she said, you too? I didn't expect this of you. And she went right back, okay? We had lots of problems with the forest department and the bureaucracy. Uh, we would get permits, they would revoke them. She was locked out for more than eight months from the forest in which she was working, okay? Um, there are elephants out there, not in very large numbers, but they're there, and they are an ever-present danger. And we've had a couple of close encounters. And lastly, uh, we had Naxal and anti-Naxal uh, elements there in those forests. Again, not in very large numbers, but in enough numbers to give us trouble. I mean, I think on at least two occasions we've had, you know, people surrounding us with guns and saying, you can't work here, okay? So this was, I don't think anybody has gone through so much in the course of a PhD as Swati has. Um, but what she actually managed to do was to nail down who all of these different signalers in that forest were and what their calls look like. And these are really nice and I'm gonna play you some of these. Um, so we got 20 species in three different groups. Let me play you some of these. This is a cricket that lives only in rotten logs on the forest floor, only on rotten logs. This one lives in the leaf litter and it has a very harsh call. Very broad band, lots of frequency. in the understory, lovely call, we call it the whiner, uh, we still don't know what species it is. These are false leaf catedids, as you can see they look exactly like leaves. This one has a higher frequency. And this one, one of my favorites, lives high up in the canopy, again a false leaf and has almost like a bear. And this was perhaps our most exciting find. These are waiters. These are among the largest insects in the world. They are found in New Zealand. They are found in Australia. They are found in South Africa. And they were reported from the 1880s from India, but we rediscovered them. And we found that they made sounds, which was amazing. You hear the cut, cut. That, yeah. So for a long time we thought they were tree frogs, but when Swati tracked them down one day, she called me at midnight saying, "Do you know what? That's not a frog. It's a cricket." <laughs> okay. Not only were they crickets, but the males and females sing differently. So what you heard was a female. I'll play a male. They have longer calls, okay? We don't know whether they do it, but this was a very exciting find. Okay, so now we knew who our animals were and what their calls looked like. So the next thing she did, somehow Swati always picked these really hard things to do, was she actually sampled walking through the forest in transects in three hour periods, and over a period of time, she did this around the clock in three hour windows, which means all times of day and night. And what we found at the end of that was, for us, a little bit disappointing, which was that the dust chorus well starts abruptly, it dies off slowly, uh, there's no dawn chorus, they don't call in the mornings, but we didn't find any kind of evidence that different species were actually calling at different times of the night. Everybody seemed to like to call at the same time between about 7 o'clock and 10.30. 
We did find some evidence for finer temporal partitioning. We did find, however, some good evidence for partitioning out in spectral space. Um, she then looked to see whether they were partitioning out in vertical space by figuring out which animal calls from where. And what you see here is each of these different species and the height at which they typically call. There are ground callers, some that call just above the ground, about half a meter. These are the guys in the understory, and these are the guys up in the tree canopies. And you can see that they are quite nicely layered. The problem is that that doesn't tell you what the sounds are like, right? Sound goes out. Even if I'm sitting on the ground, it's probably traveling out. So the problem really is, if you want to understand interference, you actually have to, again, go into how sound propagates in this environment. So just to give an example, let's say there's an individual of species A and an individual of species B. This one's calling at 80 decibels, this one's calling at 72. Sound from here is, is moving outward, but also attenuating. Sound from here is moving outward and attenuating. And this again would be, well, this is in 2D, but you can think of it as a sphere of influence in three dimensions. Um, within the sphere, a female is likely to hear this male. Within this sphere, a female of this species is likely to hear this male. And the, the intersection is where females are likely to hear both males, okay? Figuring out these intersections and figuring out all of this took us quite a while. Because one of the things we needed to know was what happens to sounds in the forest. It's, sound is a very tricky business, especially when you're in a highly vegetated environment. It's not easy to predict, especially when you're either in the canopy or the ground. So my next student, Manjari Jain, did her thesis looking at acoustics, forest acoustics, habitats, and calls. So basically what she did was to take all of these calls that we had of these insects in the forest, play them back from speakers at different heights, going from the ground all the way up to the canopy. And then she would re-record these calls at different distances to see how they attenuated and how they degraded. So this entire process took her an entire PhD's worth of time, which is five years. But at the end of that, we had a very good understanding of what the forest does to these sounds. Just to give you one tiny glimpse um, I'm just showing you some attenuation curves. What does this mean? Here's one of the species is actually a ground caller. And what you have in these graphs is this is the SPL at which we played back, which is about 72 dB, which is the SPL at which it falls. And then you re-record at different distances and it falls off, falls off exponentially, which is what you expect. But look at this. So each of these lines is a different height. And you can see there's not huge differences here at the higher levels. As you come down, the ground is a terrible place to be. Look at the curve, right? It's a very steep follow. And yet these animals will call from the ground, okay? Um, here's another species from the understory where you can see that it's very well suited to the height at which it falls, which is this one, which is where it has the least follow. If it called from the ground or the canopy, it would have much steeper decline. So on and so forth, you can do for so many different species. You can also look at their structures. So you know now what I showed you in the cartoon before, how those sounds are falling off. And we had actual data. So the next thing we did was we also knew where each of these collars were. So Manjuri went out and actually tracked where each individual insect was as well. So we knew you know, where each collar is with respect to each other. I've just given you a, a cartoon um, to illustrate this. And what we did spend a lot of time doing was to come up with a 3D acoustic simulation model that could capture this complex scenario. You know, how many, uh, how many neighbors can you actually hear? And it's somewhat non-trivial problem. We were helped in this by a computer engineer, but we finally managed to come up with a simulation model which captured, you know, if I'm a female standing here, you know, how many of the neighboring calling males can I actually hear? given how far apart they are, given what their calls look like, given how their calls fall off, given the temporal relations between them, okay? So we were able to estimate what masking actually looks like out there in the forest. And what we got was a huge surprise because, well, I'm not putting up the graphs to you, 
But for almost every individual that we looked at, for every species, sorry, that we looked at, the median of interference was zero. Okay, what does that mean? It means most individuals of these species are actually experiencing very little interference, which is why I called it sounds of silence. If you actually go in and take all the axes of separation, spectrum, uh, distance, timing, relative timing, space, everything into account, the reason why people think that there's a lot of interference, I feel, is because nobody actually measures everything. And if you take into account all of these axes, then what you find is really that what appears to be a cacophony, if listened to through the ears of the insect listener rather than the human listener, would be a much quieter world. Okay? So that's the lesson we learned from 11 years of work. <laughs> we got zero. <laughs> all right? So, Swati then went on uh, to continue work actually looking at acoustic signals, particularly of the waders. And she's currently working on crickets of Northeast India, so her love for tracking crickets in the forest has not gone away, even though now as an assistant professor in Delhi, uh, she sadly doesn't get enough time to go out there in the forest, but she continues to do some of this work. And Manjuri um, is now an assistant professor at Isar Mohali, and she continues work as well in looking at the ecology and evolution of acoustic signals. And as you can see, she has a very large research group. Okay. So for me, it's a matter of enormous pride. And last year at the bioacoustics meeting, um, it was a special pride for me to have my two former students and all of their students uh, all there together working, continuing work on the acoustics of signaling. Okay, um, so let's move on. Where, how am I doing for time? Is that much? Okay, great, all right. Uh, so let's move on then. We talked about senders and signals. The other end of the system, of course, is the receiver, right? So you've got a receiver who receives the signal through ears, and the receiver can do many things also to avoid masking interference, okay? So we started out looking at receivers. Oh, I don't have to walk. <laughs> um, and the animal we chose to look at was this nice canopy catered uh, in large part because I was, I'm just very fond of this animal and it has an amazing sound. And so this was the animal we first started out looking at the ear of. And what you can see here are the four legs of the insect, and these are the eardrums, actually. Okay? So it's, there are these two eardrums on each ear, and that's a picture of that. And Kaveri Rajaraman, who was a postdoc in my lab, actually uh, did the work looking into the physiology. If this video works, I'll show you. So today you can do these very nice micro CT scans. How many of you know what a CT scan is? You must have heard of it, right? So there, there are these x-ray scans that you can get done of yourself in a hospital to look at your internal organs without cutting you up and uh, reconstructing them in 3D. But now you can do it on very small animals. And so that's really exciting. So we can look into the bodies of these very small animals. So we wanted to look at the ears of these animals. And so um, we did a micro CT scan. I hope this thing works. Yes. OK. What you will see as this moves on is it will strip off the, yeah the cuticle and it will show you what's inside. And this is real, you know, this is of a real animal. So this is the ear, they are the two ears. So you can see the ear is just a system of tubes, okay? So there's an eardrum and then there is this curved tube inside, there are two tubes, okay? All right. So what is this animal listening to and is the ear doing anything interesting? Entry point for the ear, whether it's your ear or the ear of a cricket, is the eardrum, right? So all of you know that sound is actually, well, it's, it's an oscillation, it's a mechanical oscillation, right? It's pressure. And eardrum rate when sound is incident on them, whether it's your eardrum or an insect eardrum. It's very simple. So the first thing you, you want to look at, if you want to look at hearing, is to look at the eardrum itself. And what we wanted to ask is, if we, if we pound this eardrum with sounds of different frequencies, 
does it vibrate similarly to all frequencies or not? So that's the experiment that we did. So if you give sounds of different frequency to this eardrum, so the way you do this is you immobilize a cricket in the lab and you have a technique called laser vibrometry. So you point a laser at a point on the eardrum, okay? And then you play sound. If the eardrum vibrates, then the laser will be able to pick it up. I'm not gonna go into how it does that. Okay? But basically, it'll give you a signature of the vibration. So you give different frequencies to the eardrum and you look at the displacement, that is how much the eardrum is vibrating at each of these frequencies. And you can see that up to about, this is actually 3.5 to 4 kilohertz, it vibrates at this level of here around 20, and then you can see the crash, it dips, and then it vibrates at a much lower level. So this is actually vibrating at a high level for low frequencies, and then after a certain point, the vibrations is just much less sensitive, right? In other words, it's acting as a low pass filter. If you now ask at what frequencies is it vibrating well, let's look at, this, uh, let's look at the spectrum of the call of this animal. It's almost pure tone at 3.3. This falls off after 3.5, okay? So after 3.5, it's relatively deaf to the higher frequencies. If you take a spectrogram of the forest in which it lives, here is 3.5, here, here is the frequency of this animal, okay? And it falls off sharply. You can see all the noise, a lot of noise in the forest is actually about that. So basically, this ear can filter out a lot of noise, okay? A lot of relevant noise, noise in the higher frequencies that it experiences. And this is very exciting for us because most filtering that we know of happens typically at the neural level, okay? It happens by physiological processes. Whereas here, that filtering is happening straight out at the ear, the eardrum. So it's a mechanical filter, which is interesting, okay? Um, this kind of thing is very interesting to people who are trying to make tiny sensor devices because these are very tiny ears. And in many insects, you can find these low-pass filters, you can find high-pass filters, or you can find band-pass filters. And the secrets of how these tiny mechanical devices can act as filters uh, are something we don't understand, and which could have a lot of application, actually, in tiny devices. So a lot of engineers are very interested in this kind of problem. All right. But well, we're biologists, and we want to see how the communication works. So then we asked, well, what does a female of the species do when she hears the skull? Okay? Does she move towards the skull? That's what we expect. So we tried lab experiments. So here's a tea made from branches of jackfruit because this, this animal likes to live on jackfruit trees. And we make a tea out of branches of that. We have a little speaker and we play back sound. And what we expected was she would like any self-respecting cricket, walk towards that speaker. In that species, we got a huge surprise. Let me play this to you. Um, okay, what you see here is a female. She's standing here. She's at the end of the tree. She's on a leaf. She's walking. that leaf, every time she hears the male call, she shakes that leaf. And she'll go on doing this for three, four minutes. Okay? Every time he calls, she'll shake the leaf. She doesn't move. So when you try and look at it, what you see, so you can measure the male call using a microphone. So these are his chirps. But you can measure the vibrations that are going through the surface, okay? Using a laser vibrometer. What she's doing is standing there and tremulating. And it creates a vibrational, a pulsed vibrational signal that actually goes through this bark, okay? And you can measure that using a laser vibrometer. So he makes a call, she makes a vibrational signal. You, you, you saw that, I hope, right? He, he goes boop boop and she does shh, okay? Right, so this is the first example 
actually in the animal kingdom of an acoustic vibratory duet. Okay, so the male calls using sound and the female replies using vibration. And what Kaveri did, I'm not, I don't have time to show you this, but, but was to show that the male is able to use these vibrations to locate the female. Okay, so if they're on a tree and he's calling, right, and he gets this vibrational reply, okay, he can use that signal to navigate his way uh, to find her. Okay. She doesn't move towards him. And of course, one of the questions that we're trying to answer is, most crickets, the female will move. So why are these guys, you know, refusing to move and instead just making these vibrations? We don't know. Uh, one of the reasons might be that we know that these insects are eaten by bats and flying might be quite dangerous. And we have other data to show that that's true. So possibly that's the reason they're refusing to take that risk. Okay, so just to tell you a little bit more about Kaveri. So Kaveri, after having done all of this work is now uh, an associate professor at Ashoka University, uh, close to Delhi. How many of you know this university? It's a fairly new one. Yeah, right. And um, she's teaching uh, psychology and animal behavior there. And she's continuing work on the system. She's also a very, very strong social activist um, and uh, would alternate her time in the lab with uh, doing demonstrations and getting picked up by police and, <laughs> okay, right. Um, okay, I'll tell you one in very short, one or two last stories. This is the work of another student, Samira, who worked on this lovely animal, the racket-tailed drongo. How many of you know what a drongo is? It's an animal that's related to the crow, so the drongos are related to the crow family, but they are very special because they have these incredible vocal repertoires. So they, they, just, they, they just make all kinds of calls and signals. Um, and drongos are also very special because they mimic. They mimic the calls of other birds, of other animals. Uh, I've heard a drongo mimic a motorcycle. Okay. So, uh, so, you know, why do they mimic? You know, who do they mimic? What do they mimic? And Samira did her PhD on that. And she did her PhD in the Biligiri Rangan Hills, the BRT Sanctuary, which is south of here. And again, hard terrain to work in, following drongos in the forest, making recordings of their call, making observations, doing playbacks. Um, well, just for fun, let me show you how good a mimic the drongo is. Um, so on the, okay, the spectrograms on the left, so this is a brown-cheeked fulvetta, it's a kind of babbler. This is the call of the babbler, and this is the call of a drongo mimicking the babbler. Similarly, this is, so in each of these, the left one is the model, the actual animal, the fairy bluebird, and this is a drongo making that call. So let me play these to you. Um, so here's a brown-cheeked fulvetta. Here's the drongo. What did I do? Okay. Let's go again. It's the brown cheek full better. Can you tell them the bird? Okay, the fairy bluebird. Okay. Woodpecker. This is a common flame back. This is a drongo mimicking it. They even mimic monkeys. There's a bonnet monkey. Okay. So how do we know these are drongos? Because she can see them. These are all her recordings. Okay. Um, so what did she find? She finds that they, oh, I should put it on full screen. Mm. Sorry, a little bit. Okay. They actually, she, she got like 35 species of birds, three mammals, two frogs, one insect in her couple of years of fieldwork recording. Drongo calls, wide variety 
the question, of course, is why are they doing this? We have some insights into why they're doing this. If you look more deeply into all those different kind of mimicry, you find that some kinds of mimicry consist of these very repetitive notes that they make. And these are usually made when they're singing in the mornings. Okay. Uh, you hear many birds singing in the mornings, and these are made at that point, but they're mimicking other species, incorporating it into their songs. There are other times when they will sit low in the near, nearer the forest floor and you know just make one or two calls of different species. Interestingly, these two types uh, of syntax, as we call them, uh, involve different species being mimicked. And when you look more deeply into this, the second type, the non-repetitive ones, are made um, mimicking babblers, woodpeckers, and typically species with which they feed together. So brongos feed in what are called mixed species flocks, and it's almost like they're calling these other species towards them. So they sit in one place and keep on calling, okay, in the language, if you like, of each of the different species. And we did some playback experiments here to show that Yes, when you do this, you actually do attract uh, those species to you. So it's almost like they get that flock together, yeah, using this. Less clear why they use these other sets of calls, which we believe may have to do with sexual selection, but we're not sure. Okay. Um, Samira also, in the course of her work, recorded over 100 species of birds, and she made a very, very nice uh, CD out of this. Um, where she has the birds and the calls of all of these over 100 species. We're sort of looking to put it up on a good website so it can be downloaded. Um, finally, do I have five minutes? Yeah. I'll talk to you a little bit about Smita Nair. Smita Nair did actually the first studies on acoustic signaling in elephants uh, in India. And she worked with myself and Professor Sukumar. And this was perhaps the hardest and most dangerous uh, project that anyone ever did. She, she worked in Mudumalai uh, Wildlife Sanctuary and tried to look at the repertoire of elephant calls and what they used them for. And the basic classification that we got out of that exercise, everyone knows about trumpets, uh, but I don't know if you know about these other kinds of calls. So I'm going to play them to you. Okay, so we've got of course, the trumpets that everyone. Um, but elephants can also roar when they are aggressive. Okay. And then they can make these incredible. <laughs> if you ever hear this in the forest, be careful. <laughs> if you ever think this is made up. <laughs> like a cross between a duck and a dog. Um, and they make it when they are upset and uncertain, uncertain what the source of danger is, um, and they're very, very agitated. And then, of course, there are the rumbles, which are probably very famous, and these are the very low frequency sounds. I don't know if the speaker will produce them. I will try. Uh, they're very, very low frequency sounds. Um, and these can travel kilometers. Um, we tried to figure out what these different calls are being used for, but I'll just show you a few videos to wrap up. So this is just some of the, you know, interesting interactions. Trumpet, this is with wild dogs. And that's in Chasing Away. And this is to show you a roar context. They yeah, pushed the other one out. So they often roar either when they play or when they're being aggressive to each other. Um, and here's another with the rumble. You won't see very much here because they stand very still in the rumble. Can you hear the rumble? Yeah, 
and often when they are, uh, you know, when they are foraging together, they will get separated. The herd will get separated in the forest, and then they often contact call using these rumbles. Or when a young one gets lost, it will often rumble to uh, get back to the herd. Um, oh, this was a funny incident where an elephant herd ran into bears, and uh, it was. By the way, so that's the elephant, and they surround this tree that has a bear. I don't know if you can see the bear. Uh, so those funny sounds are the chirps of the elephant. So what had happened is they ran into a mother and a baby, and the mother climbed one tree and the baby climbed another. And the elephants were milling around this. We just happened to see that whole thing uh, while it was happening. And at that point, they made every possible call. Huh? All right. So I think, you know, having to study these things, what do you need if you need to study animal acoustic signaling? Well, you need piles of patience because you don't control your subjects in any way. As you can see, you need a lot of courage, especially if you're working outside and working outside at night. A lot of determination, a lot of persistence, and above all, a lot of passion. Otherwise, you just don't, you're not going to be willing to put in the rest. And as I said, almost all of this kind of hard field work has been done uh, by my women students. Um, I am going to stop here again and I will take